take your Bibles and turn with me to Matthew chapter 28. Uh, we're going to begin this series with the end in mind and with a passage that will probably be familiar to most of you. But I have been praying all week that it will be as fresh to you as it was to me as I leaned once again uh, into it this morning. Uh, but before we get there, Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20, I want to put you guys in a time machine this morning. Are you ready? All right, let's go all the way back to the year 2000. Y2K, all right? So let's all go back there. The year 2000. I want you to imagine that it's a Friday night and you're with your spouse, or you're with your family and you say to yourself, you know what? It's been a tough week and I'd really just enjoy some entertainment tonight. So we'd like to watch a movie. Now in the year 2000, you would have to do something unimaginable. You would have to get in a physical vehicle. You would have to drive to a location to which you would enter a storefront that looked kind of like this that I'm gonna put up on the screen for you this morning, right? In that storefront would be thousands of DVDs or some of you in 2000 were probably still playing VHS tapes, right? And there you would have to argue, decide, choose, flip a coin, whatever, because the movie you wanted wasn't ever available. You'd have to go for your second or third choice, but you would actually have to rent a disc, a physical silver shiny disc, bring it home and put it in something called a DVD player. Listen to this. You didn't even have to be connected to the internet for it to work. It was amazing, right? It was a phenomena in our culture. And in the year 2000, Blockbuster had over 9,000 locations worldwide. As a company, it was worth $8 billion. And in that same year, a punk CEO from an upstart company called Netflix visited the corporate headquarters of Blockbuster, walked into their boardroom and presented an audacious idea. For the low sum of only $50 million, he would partner with Blockbuster. He would stream Blockbuster's content online and Blockbuster would promote Netflix in its stores. He was laughed out of the boardroom. Fast forward 13 years. 2013, Blockbuster declares bankruptcy. Do you know how many Blockbuster stores there are left now? One. <laughs> If you wanna follow it on Twitter, it's pretty hilarious. It's called The Last Blockbuster, all right? There is one store left. The company itself bankrupt, they're just still using the name. Netflix, on the other hand, has become an institution of our society, 90 million subscribers worth $85 billion today, right? Oh, how quickly things change. You see, Blockbuster somewhere along the way forgot that its primary mission wasn't keeping stores open, its primary mission was delivering great entertainment content in an accessible way. Netflix found a way to do it better. It's called disruptive technology. And one of the case studies that I read on it this week, the author says this, Blockbuster initially succeeded because they did one core job better than anyone else, delivering entertainment to people's homes. But as we know, things change. And instead of investing their efforts into finding a new way to deliver on their true purpose, Blockbuster stagnated. When a once successful company loses touch with the purpose that made it great, disaster follows. When it loses touch with the purpose that made it great, disaster follows. So let's take this little case study and let's apply it to the church in the United States. How are we doing? Well, 90% of churches in the United States are either plateaued or declining, not keeping up with the population rate in the area in which they are located. There are right now 100,000 Christian evangelical churches in the United States that are at risk of closing their doors in the next five to 10 years, unless something happens. What's interesting is, is we have come to grow accustomed to a certain way of doing and thinking about church in the United States and in North America in which we're dependent upon buildings and programs and professionals to run those programs and seminaries and institutions. And all of these things are okay as long as they serve the one command that Jesus gave his people, his followers. Do you know what that command was? to make disciples. You see, when we start putting our emphasis on these other things, when we forget what that one purpose is, then we lose 
our way. So let's begin this next chapter of ministry by remembering what matters to Jesus, making disciples. Stand with me in honor of God's word as we read from Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. This is not the great suggestion. It is called the great commission. Verses 18 through 20. Jesus came near and said to them, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. Pray with me this morning. Heavenly Father, we confess that we are easily distracted, that our attention and our affection is easily pulled in different directions. And there are many days that we forget the commission that you gave to your disciples and that has now come to us. I pray that as we begin this new chapter and season of life and ministry together as your people, that you would fix our heart on the imperative that Jesus delivered to his disciples then and that he gives us, his disciples now. It's to be disciples, followers of Jesus, who make disciples. That's the one great purpose that advances your kingdom. So, Father, until all nations hear, would you find us faithful and would you challenge and stretch us today? And it's in the name of Jesus we pray these things and all God's people said, amen. You may be seated. Now, if you're like me and if you were born, battered, buttered, bruised Southern Baptist, right, or any really any evangelical tradition, then you have heard this verse over and over again. Many of you could recite it by heart, and appropriately so. As a matter of fact, it reminds me of the old, you might be a Southern Baptist if jokes, right? You might be a Southern Baptist if you feel God's presence is strongest on those back three rows. Can I get an amen back there? All right. You might be Southern Baptist if you sing Amazing Grace and you think it should be the national anthem, right? You might be Southern Baptist if you woke up in the middle of the night craving fried chicken and potato salad and you interpreted that as your call to be a preacher. <laughs> you might be a Southern Baptist if you hear Matthew 28 read and you think about missionaries and mission offerings and mission giving, which is a good thing. And we'll talk about that. But it's not the only thing that Jesus is talking about in this passage. You see, I grew up as a kid thinking that these verses were done by somebody else somewhere else, but that they didn't necessarily apply to me because after all, I wasn't a missionary in the corridors of Africa or you know, in the middle of Asia somewhere. Instead, I was just a kid in a small church in a small town. And after all, you know, how could I do these kind of things for Jesus? What I didn't realize until I got older was that no, these passages, what Jesus was teaching his disciples who, by the way, were everyday ordinary guys until Jesus called them to be disciples, was that these passages apply to all of us. I love what our International Mission Board President David Platt has to say about this passage. He says that Matthew's point in writing this book, this gospel, was not only to show us that Jesus is king. That's the great theme of Matthew's gospel, written to primarily a Jewish audience. It wasn't only to show us that. If that were the case, he would have stopped in the middle of this chapter with the resurrection. So Matthew and his gospel immediately follows the story of the cross and the resurrection with these verses that we just read. Instead, Matthew ends by telling how Jesus sent out his disciples to proclaim Jesus is king to the ends of the earth. And get this, that's a story that continues even today. The beauty of this text is that you and I are a part of this story. We are disciples of Jesus the King, commissioned and sent out by him to proclaim his life, death, and resurrection all over the planet. 
So what I want you to see as we begin this journey is that you very much are a part of this story. The Great Commission is not reserved for some, quote, a class of elite super Christians who have responded to God's call to go overseas. Yes, as we'll see, we want to celebrate and call people to go overseas to tell the nations about Jesus. But it starts where we are. And it doesn't even begin with us. And that's our first point this morning. Disciples who make disciples believe in the authority of Jesus. They believe in the authority of Jesus. This is something as I was studying this week, I realized we way, way underestimate. Jesus didn't start by immediately telling them to go. Instead, he reminded them that all authority had been given and entrusted to him. All authority. And when we're talking all, like we're talking all authority. Jesus's favorite term for himself, the son of man. And when Jesus used that phrase, that didn't just mean that he was born of a woman. It meant that he was directly referring to a prophecy about the son of man to come. Look with me in Daniel chapter seven, verses 13 and 14. The prophecy of the long awaited Messiah, that he would be one like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the ancient of days and was escorted before him. He could stand in the presence of the Holy One. Verse 14, he was given dominion and glory and a kingdom. So they get this, those of every people, nation and language should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away and his kingdom is one that will not be destroyed. Y'all, Jesus was claiming that level of authority for himself, that he was the king of an everlasting kingdom and his resurrection had proved it. The only one to defeat sin and death was Jesus and now all authority had been given to him. And that authority means that he is Lord of all, period. He's Lord of all. And we need to grasp that and understand that. In evangelical circles, we're fond of saying that Jesus is my personal Lord and Savior. And so for those of us who have turned away from our sin in themselves and trusted Jesus as Savior, that is certainly true. But we also need to recognize And we need to move forward into the world, into our neighborhoods and into the nations with an understanding that Jesus is not only Lord over me, he is Lord over all. And all means all. Look with me in Philippians chapter two, verses nine through 11, where Paul records one of the early songs of the church. And because of the cross and the resurrection, it says this, for this reason, God highly exalted him. And he gave him the name that's above every name so that in the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So who will bow? Every knee will bow. What tongues will confess? Every tongue will confess. Does that say only professing Christians will bend the knee to Jesus one day? No, every knee will will bow. Here's the question. Is it going to be while they still have time to spend eternity with Jesus or is it going to be too late? That's the question. And here's the question for us. Tomorrow, do we walk into our schools? Do we look at our homes and neighborhoods? Do we walk into our places of work and business and think to ourselves, all of these people, all of them will one day bend the knee to Jesus. Will they do so willingly because I was faithful to share the gospel and they responded? Or will they do it when they realize they are going to be separated from the Lord of all for eternity? Like that's what's at stake when Jesus says, all authority has been given to me. And the picture that should grip our hearts and our minds is that of of the success of the gospel. Look with me in Revelation chapter seven, verses nine and 10 where John is given a picture of the multitude from the great tribulation who is worshiping at the throne. And in Revelation 7, 9, and 10, after this I looked and there was a vast multitude from every nation, tribe, people, and language, which no one could number, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, being Jesus. 
They were clothed in white robes and with palm branches in their hands and they cried out in a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who is seated on the throne and to the lamb. You see, that is authority. That when history is over, the multitudes who have put Jesus in the middle and the center of their hearts and of their lives will be worshiping him forever and ever. And that congregation will be made up from people from every corner of the planet, from all tribes and tongues. And so Jesus says, this is the authority that I have. What a powerful authority it is. And here's the crazy thing. He's delegated that to us. No, we're not Jesus, but we go as his messengers. We go because he has sent us. The gospel of John tells us that we are the sent ones. And in the first century, the Jewish understanding, the first century understanding of a messenger was that the messenger was sent with the authority of the one who sent him. It's why to offend or to injure or to hurt or to kill that messenger was the equivalent of declaring war on the king who sent him because he was his representative. It was important to understand. We were talking about this in modern terms and preaching team this week. And we said it was like when we were all kids and it was time for dinner. And so we went out to tell our siblings, hey, dinner's ready. Man, they keep playing wiffle ball. They keep riding their bikes. But when we went out and said, mom says dinner is ready, right? Our siblings came running because there was a different weight, right? A different sense to that authority. And what Jesus is telling us is that the Great Commission begins with him and you are sent out as his agent, as his ambassador, representing the fact that he isn't just Lord over you, you know he is Lord over all and you want your friends and family to know who their right king is. Which brings us to point two this morning. And this is our response to the commission. Disciples who make disciples reorient their entire lives to obey the command of Jesus. They reorient their lives to obey the command of Jesus. You think, I think in our day and age, people know the Great Commission. I think they know what we're supposed to be doing. They have some vague ideas, those who sit in our churches and sing our songs and hear our sermons. But here's what we are not willing to do. Disrupt our lives for the sake of the King. And so the enemy's most subtle attacks in our culture are those that take our energy sideways into things that are considered good things in our culture. And in doing so, we become way distracted and we miss the great cause of being disciples who make disciples. When we read verse 19, we immediately want to jump at the word go because it's such a power-packed little word. But the imperative, the command is to make disciples. Therefore, when I get up in the morning, I have my marching orders for Jesus. There to make disciples. Do you know where that begins? At the breakfast table with my children and with my family. Am I making disciples in my home? And then I step out, right, into my place of work and I have to ask myself the question, am I making disciples here? And I go home, have a neighbor over for dinner. Am I making disciples in my neighborhood? You see, it reframes everything. And suddenly things that seemed important aren't so important. And I realize there's other things that I have been neglecting all together. And so this imperative to make disciples, we're given three participles that go with it. Now, all of you who hated language arts, right? Hang with me for a minute, because this is where the old diagramming sentences, anybody hate that the way I did? But it plays out, because the imperative is to make disciples. But there are three participles that help us understand how that's done. Going, baptizing, and teaching. Let's talk about going for a moment. The intent of the original language here is as you go. So again, for those of us who have assumed that's just for missionaries, yes, it includes them because they are responding to a call to go. We'll talk about that in a moment. But for all of us, the tense, the sense is as we go, we are looking for opportunities to share the gospel. We are looking for opportunities to help people grow in Christ likeness. We are looking for any opportunities that God has placed around us by which we can point people to Jesus. Today is a Sunday in which I am as excited about something that's happening away from this campus as I am excited about what's happening here. And I'm excited about what's happening here. I'm glad to see you guys and I'm glad we're kind of all back after the summer. But today, something is happening that we have been praying for for eight and a half years since we launched the church at Station Hill. 
You see, we prayed that we would not only be faithful to our mission to reach our community, but we prayed that God would call people up and out of here to reach other communities as well. And so this morning, in about seven and a half minutes, Grove Hill Church will launch their first official worship service. 40 adults, 30 children and students out of the church at Station Hill about a year, year and a half ago began to be moved that they were called to go start a new work. Because there are a few churches between us and Murfreesboro, we began thinking the College Grove area might be the right place. As their launch team began meeting and praying and looking at schools and space they might meet in, they connected with a group of people from Chapel Hill Community Baptist Church. They were looking for a pastor. And so they found one in our own Ridley Barron from our congregation. And they basically said, hey man, we want you to come be our pastor. And he said, that's great. As long as I can bring 70 of my friends with me. And so in a way that we didn't expect, those two churches came together and have now merged and formed Grove Hill Church. Station Hill Church, Thompson Station, Spring Hill, College Grove, Chapel Hill, Grove Hill. See what we did there? We're crazy creative around here. (laughs) But how cool is it that this is the business that God is still in? That among our neighbors, there are those of us who will say, you know what, I love what God's doing in my church, but I recognize that I live in this community or this neighborhood and there are people here who need the gospel. We know that area along that stretch of 840 is growing already. We know there are thousands more who are gonna be moving there in the coming years. God has already given us a people in a church and you know what, I'm glad they're not here today. Not because I love them but precisely because I do. And I want every single one of you to find that adventure, to find that place as you go in life where you are called to participate in the mission. They're wonderful people. We're going to miss them. As a matter of fact, at eight o'clock, they kind of all sat here. And so we've had this whole all summer, right? At the eight o'clock service. I miss seeing them, but I am more excited that they are being obedient to Jesus. So pray for them. If you've got family and friends who live out that way, tell them about it. Today, they're meeting in a big tent on a future property, piece of property they hope to one day build on. But go to grovehillchurch.org, pray for them, encourage them, support them, let people know they're there, and then pray, Lord, Where might you be calling me as I go? Not only are we supposed to go to our neighbors, but this passage makes it clear that God also calls us to go to the nations. That phrase, by the way, for nations doesn't mean like geopolitical countries. It means people groups. And almost every Sunday we pray for an unreached people group. There are 11,000 people groups in the world. Do you know how many of them are unreached? over 6,000 of them. That means there's 2% or less Christians among that people group. So there is a need for us to go. And so for years and years, we've been praying that God would call some families up and out of Station Hill to go. And this year on Easter, many of you are with us. We commissioned Brian and Wendy Frady to go to the heart of Africa with their two boys, Hunter and Gunner. And they are there now. And their God's going to use them in Central Africa. The skill set that they had, Brian in law enforcement and Wendy in nursing as a part of an IMB team there to reach out and to make disciples in the heart of Africa. We celebrate that. We pray for them. We hope that God is going to call some of you up and out of here to go to a people group for which he gives you a particular affection. As we pray for these people groups, I know there are some of them that just grip your hearts. And as you pray, we have to ask ourselves, Lord, are you calling me to go? So we make disciples as we go right here in Middle Tennessee to the ends of the earth. And the mark of a disciple is that they are baptized, that we baptize those who respond to the gospel. Why? So they can identify with Jesus in his death and in his resurrection. So the first step of obedience for everyone who comes to faith in Jesus is being baptized. And as we often talk about, he's not gonna show you the next things until you're obedient with the first things. So there are many who still need to be baptized to show that they have surrendered their sin and themselves and they have followed Jesus. This year, we have been blessed to see more baptisms up to this point in this year than in any year previous. In just two weeks from tonight, we will have our big baptism service so that if Sunday morning freaks you out for whatever reason, 
Come be baptized with a bunch of people on a Sunday evening, but we will baptize you in any service, uh, any opportunity that we have, because we think it's that important. And to encourage you with some of the stories of some of the lives that have been changed this year, I want to show you a baptism video of the baptisms we've experienced so far this year at the church at Station Hill. Watch this with me. I felt Jesus in my heart and wanted to follow him. I want to be respectful to God and be closer to him and I want him to wash all my sins away forever. I want to learn more about him so I can tell my friends. I want everyone to know Jesus died for them. I was so excited because someday I'll get to go to heaven and see Jesus. I want to see Jesus in heaven and God and other Christians The moment I gave my life to Christ for good was the moment I became free from the life of loneliness and sin that I've been living. We have redemption through His blood and forgiveness, and that is exactly what I want in my life, to glorify Him. I believe that Jesus died for my sins and rescued me. I want to remove the shame and guilt of my past and begin a totally new life. I love Jesus. I know that Jesus died on the cross for my sins, and He loves all of us. Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior, and He is the one who has control over my life. I want to be baptized to show everyone I love Jesus. I became a Christian because I wanted to live with Jesus forever. I decided I wanted to become a Christian to follow Jesus for the rest of my life. I realized that I'm a sinner and I needed to let him be the Lord of my life. Today I'm getting baptized to tell the world that I belong to Jesus. So praise God. (laughs) Praise God that we are seeing parents and grandparents discipling in the home with those kids. We are seeing our outreach ministries, people who are responding to Christ and wanting to follow him in believer's baptism. So if you haven't done that, then I want to encourage you to follow through. Come talk to us after the service. Email us, grab Brandon uh, or Brian, because we want you to take that first step so that those next steps will become clear as you go out into the world as a disciple maker. Going, baptizing, teaching. And there's something important that we need to continue to teach as we go. And that's our third point this morning, that disciples who make disciples depend, depend on the presence of Jesus. We call this a sandwich text because it's important for us to know that it begins with the authority of Jesus. We respond to his commission to make disciples, but we are undergirded, supported, dependent on the presence of Jesus. And we often overlook this. Know that as you go, I know it feels sometimes scary, intimidating, all of these things, but what was Jesus' final promise to his disciples? And I will be with you. So we don't make disciples for Jesus, right? He doesn't need us to do anything for him because he is God. But he gives us the grace and the privilege of making disciples with him. It's his power and presence by his spirit that moves us, that's preparing hearts in advance. It's his power and presence that helps us to have the words to say when we're struggling with what to say. It's his power and presence that reminds us of the scripture that we need to share that will transform the life. You see, it's not really about us at all. It's about him working in and through us. So remember that, be confident in that, rest in that assurance that as you go, he goes with you. After all, it's Matthew who starts his gospel in chapter one with reminding us that Jesus was the fulfillment of the Emmanuel prophecy, God with us. And now at the end of his gospel, he reminds us that Jesus is with us until the work is done all the way to the end of the age until the gospel is preached to all nations. So what does this look like for us as a church? Because after all, this wasn't a commission given to isolated individuals, it was given to a group of disciples. And here at the church at Station Hill, we are disciples. 
Well, one thing we are rallying around is learning new language and ways to express the great commission of Jesus that connects in our world and in our time. So here is our new mission statement that we adopted last year as a church, all eight campuses. Here's the way we express the great commission. Our mission is simply this, engaging the whole person. We believe that Jesus cares about the needs of people. And we engage the whole person. The answer they're looking for is the whole gospel of Jesus Christ. Not just a part of it, but the whole gospel of Jesus Christ. And we need to be equipped to do that. Not just in a Sunday morning worship service or in a Bible study, but anywhere, anytime with anybody. So this time for us is a time, as it says in Hebrews 10, to provoke, to stir up and encourage one another. The reason why we gather is to hear testimonies, is to see baptisms, is to sing the praises of our God, to remember who he is so that we can de be deployed to be carriers of the Great Commission anywhere, anytime with anybody. And as a church, we've set a goal for the next five years for ourselves because we want to be able to hold each other accountable and again, provoke and stir up one another as we move towards our mission. So this next slide reminds you of our five-year mission. Don't miss this first phrase, in response to God's leading, in response to Jesus's commission. We will see disciples, 10,000 of them. That basically represents all of our members at all campuses. What that means is that you are all part of the mission. We don't want any spectators, all of you. We are calling you to be participants, that if you know Jesus, then you are a part of this mission who will share the whole gospel with our neighbors and our nations. We wanna see and record 500,000 gospel conversations in the next five years, knowing that many of those will lead to professions of faith. And so that app, other things we're gonna talk about in this series are designed to help equip you. We've talked about this a lot, but we're going deeper and we're gonna be more focused in how we equip you to share the gospel than ever before. We have a team of gospel coaches that are being trained right now who can meet you for coffee or lunch or breakfast or who can come sit down with your life group just like a coach in an area of life. This person is going to be trained to help you think about gospel conversations, how to start the conversation, how to follow up, up, how to point people to key places in the Bible so that they can know the gospel. All of these things will help us drive towards our goal of connecting those people to a hundred healthy congregations in Middle Tennessee and beyond. Not all campuses, but campuses, church plants like Grove Hill, network partners, churches that we are planting among our international people groups right here in Middle Tennessee. We are excited about what God is doing because we believe he has called us to not build an institution but to steward a movement, the commission that Jesus gave his disciples. And so for us, it begins with, am I going to be a disciple maker? And I love what a couple of our North American mission, uh, missionaries wrote uh, in one of their books. I wanna put this on the screen for you as we close this morning. There is nothing more freeing than abandoning your own mission, right? We all have this little purpose in life that you know, we're trying to aim for, and whether it's achievement, whether it's financial success, whether it's fame, whatever it is, know that there is nothing more freeing than laying that down, abandoning that, and joining the everyday mission of God. That's what Jesus was inviting the first disciples to. And that's what he's inviting you to as well today. Will you bow your heads with me as we come to this time of response? Oh, Jesus, it's unbelievable to me in some ways that you entrusted the spread of the gospel to 11 ordinary men. That your spirit came upon a handful of believers, men and women, in a room in Jerusalem. And God, from there, the gospel fanned out all over the world because they never forgot their one singular purpose, to be disciples who made disciples. Father, I pray today that we will let go of the good things in order to pursue your great call on our lives. I pray that your spirit in these coming weeks will disrupt and disorient us so that we let go of the things that we have made to be important or thought important, but that are not important in light of eternity. So Father, today, 
Would you light the fire of your spirit in us to be about the singular purpose in all areas of our life of making disciples of Jesus? And it's in his name we pray. And all God's people said, amen.